It's this socket, you may not recognize it right away, but I'm pretty sure they have heard of it before. It's a combination lock. Yes, the same locks we use on doors so that our friends can enter our bases, but how in the hell is this the most useful circuit in all of Redstone? Well, whether you believe me or not, buckle up, as today we explore why it's literally everywhere. To better understand why it's so useful, let's try to crack one to understand how it works. The idea of a combination lock is to flick the lever around so that this lamp here lights up, or a door opens like over there, or really anything happens, you name it. Now if we take a look at the circuit, we see that this redstone line being on is turning off that lamp because it goes into a torch that inverts the signal, and you can see that if I unpower the line like so, the lamp actually turns on. And we can see that behind each lever, we either have a torch or repeater feeding into that line. And so it means that as soon as one torch, like this one, or one repeater, like this one over there, is powered, it powers the entire line, turning the lamp off. So to crack a combination lock code, we need to turn off every repeater and every torch that feeds into the line so that the line actually turns off and the lamp turns on. And that is surprisingly easy. For repeaters, we need the lever behind it to be off, because as you can see, when the lever is off, the repeater is thus unpowered as well, which is what we want. And for torches, we need the lever to be on, because when current goes into a torch, it gets unpowered and thus doesn't power the line. But as soon as the lever doesn't follow these rules, the line is gonna get powered, so that it's impossible for the lamp to turn on, making combination locks having only one unique combination that works, and I think that is super neat and useful. So now, we know everything we need to know to crack this combination lock we've been staring at for the past minutes. Let's crack it now, so let's go through each lever one by one. We can see that behind that first lever, we have a repeater, so let me turn it off to unpower the line from that lever. Behind the next one, we have a torch, so let me turn it on to unpower the torch. Again, we have a repeater, so turning the lever off, and finally, we have a torch again, so we turn the lever on. And boom, we crack the code, the lamp is on, amazing. Now, we can think a bit differently about a combination lock. What you input is some flicked or unflicked levers, but we can think of it as a binary number. Flicked levers being ones and unflicked levers being zeros. And any combination of flicked levers is a binary number. For example, here we have 1010, which translates to 10 in our number system. Meaning that we need to input the number 10 in our combination lock to unlock it. 10 is the code you need to enter. But <laughs> fear not, all you need to understand for the rest of this video is that we can treat the inputs of a combination lock as a number, and that a bunch of zeros translates to a number we use every day, like 4, 8, 69, <laughs> nice. So this circuit is good for doors, but if it was only that, I wouldn't be making a video about it in the first place. Believe it or not, those three absolutely humongous builds we have in front of us actually use these combination locks in three different ways. Let's start with the first one over there, which is chess in Minecraft built by Mabba Wings and I. In this build, for example, each square of the chessboard contains a piece with an AD containing a 4-bit binary number under it. There are 12 different pieces in chess, 6 for white, 6 for black, so the white pawn would have an AD of 0, the black pawn would have an AD of 1, etc, etc, until we get to the black king, which is 11. Now, there is a mechanic in chess where if one enemy pawn gets to your side, like for example this black pawn getting over there, they can promote it or swap it for another piece. And that's where the combination lock comes in. It's used to detect if a pawn is on one end of the chessboard. If we want to detect if a white pawn is in this square for example, which means that we could promote it, what we would do is pass the ID of the square's piece through a combination lock. Remember, an ID is a binary number, and we can input binary numbers in a combination lock. So if we build the combination lock so that it unlocks when the white pawn's ID is passed, then we would have successfully detected if a white pawn is there. In practice, it looks like this. We can see that we have four redstone signals flowing outwards of the cell, which is the ID of the piece currently in it. And here is our combination lock decoding for the white pawn, which is number six. Right now, the piece currently in is a black knight, which has an ID of 8, so the combination lock isn't outputting anything. But lo and behold, when we put a white pawn here, so let me move it there, the output switches to 6 and we get an output. By the way, I know that I said that the white pawn's ID was 0 earlier, but it's actually 6. My bad. So to conclude, in this build, a combination lock is used for number equality. Let's check out some more uses. 
Now for our next stop in a world of big redstone contraptions, one of Minecraft's most powerful computers, Chungus 2 built by Sam Yuri. Well, don't worry, I won't explain how this whole thing works because I don't know myself. But this build uses a very interesting and widely used concept which is called decoders for its memory. Imagine a street of for example 8 houses and each house has a number associated to it which is its address. Let's set the house's address to 0, the next one to 1, all the way to 7 on the opposite end of the street. Let's next say that we want to input a binary number somewhere down there so that it sends a signal to the house with a binary number as an address. For example, if I want to input 6 in the input here, a signal is going to be sent to the house with address 6 and light its lamp. Now, very conveniently, with 3 bits, we can express numbers from 0 to 7, the same way with 2 digits in our number system, we can express numbers from 0 to 99. So, what we're gonna first do is build a combination lock under each house that is going to unlock or send a signal when the house's address is inputted in it. For example, this is house at address 3, so the combination lock only lights up if the number 3 is inputted in it. By the way, those are vertical combination locks, um, they work the exact same way as the horizontal one we've seen so far, they're just vertical. So now we have 8 combination locks, each with a different number that unlocks them. All we have to do left is to input the same binary number in every combination lock. For example, if I want to send a signal to house 1 and I input the number 1 in every combination lock, so let me do that, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 1, we can see that only the combination lock of house 1 lights up because, well, each combination lock will unlock for a different number. But it's convenient to have to input the same number 8 times. What we do is we use only one input panel and put the number in every combination lock like so. Now the binary number we input is going in all combination locks. So if I input 5 in binary like so, we can see that the signal is sent to house 5. But if I input 3, for example, so this, we can see that the signal is sent to house 3, etc. And that concept is called a decoder, because it decodes what the number is the one you input it and executes an action accordingly. Now, this circuit might seem a bit daunting, but all it is is a bunch of combination locks asking themselves, is the address inputted my address? And if so, it lights up or do anything really. For our final stop, we're going to take a look at Atari Breakout built by me and my Batwings. In this machine, we need to keep track of multiple states, like the speed of the ball, where it is, where it could be hitting stuff, and so we have all that data, however we need our system to behave a certain way when certain conditions about the data are met. Now, we use what we call booleans to represent conditions. A boolean is a 1 or a 0, a redstone line being on or off, on if the condition is true, and off if it is false. You can maybe see where I'm going with this. A boolean can be inputted into a combination lock. For example, if we want to simulate a wall collision with the ball, we need to know if the ball is heading towards the wall, which is represented by that lever over there, and we also need to know if the ball is near the wall, which is represented by the next lever. Now, if the lever is activated, it means that the indicated statement is true, otherwise it's false. So, to check if both statements are true, which would mean that we would want the ball to collide, we can use a small combination lock only sending a signal when both statements are true, or in other words, when both statements are ones. And as you can see, as soon as both the levers are on, so both statements are true, so the ball is heading towards the wall and the ball is near the wall, our combination lock tells us that there is a collision. We can add more statements to that combination lock, however. For example, if we want a combination lock to go off when the time of day is night, then you only need a third torch and a daylight sensor put on night mode. And when this redstone line coming out of the sensor is on, it's going to turn off that torch in the combination lock, which is what we want. However, if we want the combination lock to only go off when it's daytime, you can either change the torch to a repeater like so, or put the daylight sensor into day mode. And that's how combination locks are used for condition checking. So yeah, combination locks can be used for number slash data checking like we saw in chess, sending a signal to a certain address in memory with Chungus 2, and finally they can be used to test if multiple simple or complex conditions are met, for example in Atari Breakout. Combination locks can be used in various other ways, but these are the main ones, and they are used everywhere, like literally everywhere. Anyway, I thought it was pretty cool, so I wanted to show you. <laughs> See ya!